John chapter 14, we're going to get right into it, and today we're going to start a three-week series on the Holy Spirit, so I hope we're ready for it, and, and I just want to tell you, I really encourage you to dig deep into this subject, and, and if it's something that you feel like God is, is opening your eyes or teaching you something new, then we also have kind of a follow-up, because still for like the next eight to nine weeks, if Wednesday works for you, Dr. Shonda Hardman is going to be, she's still teaching our, our Holy Spirit series on Wednesday nights. And so my prayer was to kind of like keep some interest sparked and, and to encourage you just, if, if you missed week one of the Holy Spirit Bible study, um, you can jump in in week two, week three, week six. It doesn't matter. We'd love for you to join us. So that's, that's our prayer. But as we get into this topic today, we want to answer this question or, or talk about who is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? And, and, and oftentimes, you know, we will sing songs, we will, uh, we will refer to Him, and we will talk about Him. Um, but as we get into Scripture, here is what Scripture says, John chapter 14, and it describes abilities, it describes a personality. Um, scripture describes a person. Scripture describes a person. Verse 26, <coughs> would you read it with me? But the Helper... The comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, strengthener, stand by the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name to represent me and to act on my behalf. He will teach you all things, and he will help you remember everything that I have told you. As we get into this topic today, and, and does everybody have their sermon notes ready to go? Uh, you got your smartphones open, we got our Bibles turned on, or our Bibles open, or our notes ready to go. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're going to talk today about Jesus, but primarily we're going to talk today about the Holy Spirit. After the death, after the resurrection of Jesus, the New Testament, and, and, and if you're kind of like new to this church thing, the New Testament is the section of books in the back of the Bible, Right? It's kind of like the section towards the end. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so we're going to be digging into the New Testament these next couple of weeks. And, and it's full of stories about early believers. It's full of stories about men like Paul, this guy named Paul, this, this, this guy named Peter, the, these, these men that were described as pillars of the church. Paul was like this amazing missionary. He was the, the most effective missionary the world has ever seen. And we have men like Peter and, and James and John that the Bible in the New Testament says these guys are the, the pillars of the church. And what jumps off the pages to me in the book of Acts in particular, but all throughout the New Testament, really, we even taught, we see words from Paul, but all throughout the New Testament is we see how much the New Testament leadership teams, we call them leadership teams, pastors, preachers, apostles, right? But how much they, they look to how much they seemed it seemed seemed it. That's I, I've, we need we need a prayer for prayer for prayer. <laughs> we need to pray for my language today that I just kind of like wake up right. No coffee, no no soda this morning, so my brain is going like wake up right. I'm trying to be good. I had iced tea with lemon this morning, and you can tell the words aren't coming out right, right. Oh my goodness, right. But uh, the New Testament leadership. They depended on, they seemed to listen to, they seemed to act with. It, it seemed like they depended on and spoke to the Holy Spirit so often in their ministries. Um, it, it seems like he was involved in every aspect of their life. It seems like the Holy Spirit was involved in every aspect of their ministry. It seemed like his opinion always mattered. Um, it, it seemed like his opinion mattered to their approach. It seemed like it mattered to like where they decided to do ministry, where they went, how they did it, who they did ministry with. Um, it seemed like it always mattered. The Holy Spirit always mattered in their approach, in their outreach. We find statements, and I don't know if this is in your handout, but all throughout the New Testament, we find these, these scriptures. And these are, a lot of them are listed in Acts, but... We find scriptures like this, that Acts chapter 5, verse 3, it says, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Scriptures that say, like, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 7, 51. The Spirit told me to go with them. We see statements like this all reoccurring throughout the New Testament. Acts 11, verse 12. For it seemed good. I love this one. 
for it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit. I love that scripture, Acts 15, 28. Uh, Acts 16, 6, it says, for they were forbidden. They were forbidden to go. They were forbidden to preach the word in Asia. It says, but they were forbidden by, do you catch this? It says they were forbidden by who? It says the Holy Spirit said no. I find it interesting, right? Part of me wants to, you know, we always want to, I want to like sit there and be like, well, who stopped them? Did the government? It says, no, no, the Holy Spirit pumped the brakes. It says we were forbidden to preach by the Holy Spirit. We were forbidden to preach the word in Africa. The Holy Spirit tells me, Acts chapter 20, verse 23, in city after city after city, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. There's, do we see this pattern today, church? We could go on and on. We could, we could find probably 50, like 100, we could probably find 50 or 100 scriptures that are similar to this. But what seems common among the early believers and the early leadership team and the pillars of the church sometimes at moments seems absent in our church culture today. Um, or I would say it like this, being a child of the greatest decades, the 80s and the 90s, somebody say yes, come on now. I think somebody's booing the 80s and the 90s. That's a boomer there, <laughs> easy boomer, right? Hold on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change out cough drops here in a second. But being a child of the 80s and, and 90s, um, I grew up, and maybe some of you can relate to this, but it, it kind of, can I, can I say it like this? I'm going to be very careful. I want to be very careful. But sometimes, growing up in the church, in the 80s or the 90s, it seemed like we made it weird to interact with the Holy Spirit. Do we hear that, church, right? Can any of us relate to that? Sometimes. I'm not saying all the time. I'm not saying corner. I'm just saying, like, I remember going to camps, and I remember a lot of times we, we think of the Holy Spirit, and one of the first things we often culturally, what do we think of? Maybe, and I don't know if it's just a Las Vegas thing or an America thing, but when we think of the Holy Spirit, what do we often think of? I heard somebody whisper it. Somebody's like, tongues, tongues, right? Sometimes we, it seems, and I would say maybe not just tongues, but oftentimes it seems like to me when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we often tend to mention the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are amazing, and we are a four-square church, and we believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the gift of tongues, right? Um, but what seems common among early believers, this interaction with, with Him as a person it almost seems neglected today, or somehow we've made it weird to interact with the Holy Spirit because of maybe what we've seen seem to possibly take the attention away from God and put the attention more on the gifts or the person. Does that make sense? Sometimes we've seen that, right? And I don't just say this, right? Um, but when I, when I read the book of Acts, I don't just say like, man, the, the churches today, we, we just... We don't have the whole way. I'm not just saying this is like a church-only problem. As I was reading this this week, and uh, I don't see where Dr. Hardman went, but I was reading her the book that she gave us by R.A. Torrey, The Holy Spirit, and I was reading a book by John Bevere, and I was reading another book about the Holy Spirit. What, what became very apparent to me, sometimes when you begin to study the Holy Spirit, here's what happens. When I read the book of Acts and I begin to learn and refresh and talk to him, I begin to realize it becomes abundantly clear how much the Holy Spirit and that relationship and that conversation and that interaction with Him is lacking in my own life. Does anybody here feel like that sometimes when you begin to get into God's Word and then you begin to stop kind of focusing on the, the sin of culture or the sin of humanity, the fallenness that's all around us, but you begin to realize, oh my gosh, God, like, what, what, where is this, this distance between us, so to speak, right? And as we talk about the Holy Spirit today, He is needed in the church. He is needed in our homes. He is needed in your life more than ever because without the Holy Spirit, there is no Christian life. You hear, would you maybe just write that down? Without the Holy Spirit, there is no Christian life. Without the Holy Spirit, church just becomes, uh, I was going to say a supper club, but we could call it a brunch club, although we're not brunching. Um, but, you know, without the Holy Spirit, church just becomes a place to socialize on a Sunday. 
right? Without the Holy Spirit, because we, we wouldn't be seeing six people in a new believer's class, or Holy Spirit Bible studies, or Roman, right? We wouldn't see the, this fruit that the Holy Spirit is, is, is growing at Cornerstone, right? Without the Holy Spirit, Scripture can, can become very lethal. Would you write some of that down? Maybe? Without the Holy Spirit, Scripture can become very harsh, it can become lethal even, right? Without the Holy Spirit, there's vision. The Holy Spirit, he, he, God, He gives us vision. He gives us ideas. He gives us joy. He gives us freedom. He gives us peace. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no Christian life. There's no Christian life. We talk about the freedom that we have, and, and we're going to get into this scripture. I love this passage. If you have a Bible, <clears throat> would you open up to uh, 2 Corinthians Chapter 3, 2 Corinthians church, chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. And, and this, this scripture, we could say it like this, there is no freedom without the Holy Spirit, church. We don't have freedom without the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and what's, what's crazy to me, we live in a country where um, freedom is just ingrained in our DNA, isn't it? I mean, it, it, come on, 2024 is around the corner, you all know what that means. It's an election year, and it's, it's it, right? Those things, like, everything gets amplified every four years because of an election year. But freedom is ingrained in our country's DNA. It's ingrained in our identity, and, and we, we talk about it. It's in conversations all around us. We live, like, we're so thankful to live where we live, right? My daughters were watching, and, and they, they really wanted to watch it. My oldest one, this, this 9-11 documentary uh, that is out on Disney Plus, and it it's, has footage that I don't even remember seeing. And I remember we were watching it <coughs> a couple nights, excuse me, and I began to, I felt like I started to get anxiety reliving 9-11, these new stories that I hadn't heard about, these phone calls that I remember hearing from the, the all these different things that had happened. And, and one of the things my kids, because they're looking at it from, I, I forget, it's like they were born in 12, 14, and 16. So 9-11 is ancient history, and so they're looking at this like, Dad, did this really happen? Dad, like when you see like the destruction from, what was it, 22 years ago, is it now? Right? When you see that, and I began, I, one night I finally had to say, we watched it like three nights in a row, and I was like, can we please turn this off? Dad's going to have a panic attack. Like, seriously, ah, turn it off, right? But we're watching this, and, and they're in disbelief. And really, they're in disbelief because what they are seeing is the ultimate power of sin in the world on full display. Because the Bible says what? Sin ultimately leads to what? Death. And that day was a horrific, tragic day in the history of our country. Something that felt like our freedoms were threatened. The way that we fly, the way that we travel, everything changed after that moment, right? If you, if you remember that moment, so much has changed since then. And so we have the, a country where we, we celebrate freedom, a country that legally we are free, yet, can we say it like this? I believe now more than ever, physically we are free, but spiritually we are in more bondage than ever before. Spiritually, we are in more bondage as a nation. Spiritually, we, we are in more addiction, more depression, more anxiety, more bondage than ever before. Why? Why is this? And we're going to, think, I think 2 Corinthians gives us a little bit of insight to this question that I just asked. I think even in our own lives, we can be challenged by this. It's possible that maybe in some homes, some churches, even in the lives of us as believers, we are believers, but we're still living in bondage. We're believers, we're still living with old sin. We're believers, but we're still living behind bars a little bit in certain areas of our lives. Why? Why is this? 2 Corinthians 3, if you read it with me, chapter, verse, verse 17. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, it says there is freedom. How many of you remember that? I think there was a song in the 90s. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Anybody remember that one? Me. Too, right? All those like, eh, 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 right? I love those songs, right? I'm glad they're retired forever, though. Right? Our drummers are, too, because they're like, our drummers are like, I can't breathe. Right? They're sitting there every, every second hitting the snare. Um, 
But I love this scripture. It says, wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, and the Bible says, can we say it like this? Where, where is the Spirit of the Lord, church? Well, He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. He's everywhere. God is everywhere. God's Spirit is everywhere. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. This is great news. That is like a part of, like, we believe God is omnipresent. Holy Spirit is everywhere at all times. David writes in Psalm 139.7, what did he say? Where can I hide from what? He says, where can I hide from your Spirit, O Lord? Where can I hide from you? So if the Spirit of the Lord is everywhere, <coughs> and as we get into this Scripture, then what is this Scripture talking about? Because it doesn't seem like freedom is everywhere, does it? It doesn't seem like freedom is everywhere. And the answer to that would be, yeah, I'll take a water from you. Thank you, sir. The answer to that would be freedom isn't everywhere. Freedom isn't everywhere. God's Spirit is omnipresent. It's available. It, he is everywhere. But freedom is not. Verse 18 so all of us who have had our veil, that veil removed, can see and reflect the glory of God. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His, what? Whose image? <coughs> our, our image? What we, what, we, what we want, what we, right? No, it says we're changed into His image. That is like the, the, the primary goal of following Jesus is to be more and more like him and less and less like me the spirit is making us more and more like him changing us to be like him number one would you write this down i think this could be an interesting way to approach this scripture this is a popular scripture in the bible but let's look let's pay attention to this i, I, I wrote this down where the spirit is lord that's where we find freedom would you write that down this morning where the spirit is lord that's where we find freedom. The Spirit of God is everywhere, church, but today He is not welcomed everywhere. Would you write that down? Because Pastor Greg was back there and he said that's good, so I'm like, ooh, he liked that one, so write that one down. Right? No, I could feel it too. I was like, that's a good one. We need to write that one down. That's, ooh, that's good. Good stuff. The Spirit of God, church, is everywhere, but He is not welcome everywhere. He's not. And we could say it like this, there is no freedom where the Spirit of God isn't welcome. There is no freedom where the Spirit of God isn't celebrate. There is no freedom where the Spirit of God is not made a big deal of. And that can apply to a school. God is definitely not celebrated in our schools. That can apply in prisons. That can apply in a bar. That can apply in government. But let's listen to, that can apply in church. That can apply in a hospital, that can apply in a home, that can apply in a brothel, that can apply in a culture. And culturally, the Spirit of God is not welcome in this culture today. It, we are in a postmodern time. He is, his Spirit is not welcome today. Let's read that scripture again, 317, 2 Corinthians. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Would you underline that? Spirit of the Lord. Spirit of the Lord. There's this Greek word, and I was reading this this week. It's, it, it's spelled K-Y-R-I-O-S, pronounced kurios. Kurios in the Greek language, but it says this. It's the definition of this word Lord. So where the Spirit of the Lord is welcome, wherever the Spirit is the Lord, there is freedom is what. But here's the definition. You want to know what the definition of that word Lord means? In this original language, it means supreme authority. Would you write that down this morning? So we could say this, wherever the Spirit is the supreme authority, wherever the Spirit is the controller, wherever the Spirit is supreme, there you will find what? Freedom. The Holy Spirit is definitely not welcomed in many places, in many, many places, schools, bars, homes, a section of governments, and like I said, even possibly maybe churches, and then we wonder, no wonder why an entire society, no matter why generations 
are addicted to other things and screens and phones, whatever it might be, but we see an entire society living in bondage and in shackles because he's not welcome to be the supreme authority. He's not welcome to be, look at that last word, the Lord. And there's no freedom where he's not recognized to be the ultimate boss in the room. Paul would write, he'd say, there's no, there's no freedom where he's not the ultimate authority in the room. Number two, number two, who is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? Well, I think the first, second thing we got to do is establish in our hearts. Establish in our hearts that the Holy Spirit is a divine person. He's a divine person. He, he has a personality. He has emotions. He has feelings. This is crucial. He is a divine person. He is God. We got to get rid of this. Has anybody, and, I, and I've done this, so has anybody ever referred to the Holy Spirit as it? We laugh, right? But that's like a misconception. We fought, we ought, we, we, it just kind of, watch it in our language. It just happens. We start referring to him as it. We just start referring to the Holy Spirit as if he's not a person. And we find and we see all throughout Scripture, we treat the Holy Spirit like he's this mystical power or some type of influencer of God. When the reality, when we talk about the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is God. And this is crucial. He's a divine person. He has wisdom, power, might, love, sensitivity, insights. He has, he has the ability to correct yet show great compassion. But so often we live our lives every day as if he doesn't deserve our reverence, our attention, our obedience, our devotion, our love. We live our lives as if he doesn't deserve to be that supreme ruler mentioned when it said the Spirit is Lord. We live our lives so often as if that's optional, don't we? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his Spirit. For his Spirit searches out everything and shows God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And get this, I love the end of this verse. No one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. Here it's knowledge credited to the Holy Spirit. This scripture is saying he's a person, he's a being that knows truth. He's a being that is truth is what scripture says, right? We have this faulty perception of the Holy Spirit. Many times do because we... We talk about him as an it, or we want to connect so much to the miraculous, or we want to focus on the gifts that we've seen. And, and, and so often, church, can I say it like this? I wanted to kind of start off with a bit of a, a boring message today. Some of us are like, well, you're really accomplishing that. Good job. Goal achieved. No, I'm teasing. But I wanted to kind of like take our minds away from this idea of the miraculous because, you know, you, it doesn't take long. You can pull up a video on Instagram and because your phone is listening to me right now um, and to you, right? But, like, you could pull up your social media and you might have, like, a clip on a reel of church where just waves of people are being knocked down. And, I'm, and by no means am I saying that isn't how the Holy Spirit moves. He can move however He wants to move. He can knock down whoever He wants to knock down, all right? But so often it seems like that is what we focus on and we focus on the signs and the wonders more than we seek to connect with the person. More than we seek to connect to the, the person of the Spirit we, we don't focus on. And all throughout Scripture, we see that He is a person. He has a personality. Uh, he, he was created, right? And as we look, Romans, it says this in Romans, He has a mind. First Corinthians, it says He has a will. Romans and Galatians says the Holy Spirit has emotions. The book of Acts says he comforts. The book of Hebrews says he speaks. 1 Corinthians says he teaches. Ephesians says he feels sorrow. Hebrews says he can be insulted. <coughs> the book of Acts says he can be resisted. The book of Acts also says he can be lied to. He can be lied to. Well, the Holy Spirit is God. He is deity. These attributes are so clear over and over in Scripture. 
But why then does it seem like today the Holy Spirit in churches and in a nation might just be the most misunderstood person in the church? Why is that? Number three. Number three. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is God. And this is a concept, and I heard we got into it. I was a little under the weather Wednesday, and so I wasn't able to be there at our Holy Spirit series, but you can't begin without talking about the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, right? And this is a concept to me that is always mind-blowing and always mind-boggling, but the reality is if we have faith, it's called faith for a reason because we're always going to have questions, aren't we? But the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the, God, God the Holy Spirit, they are always working together. They are never contradicting each other. They are never working against each other, right? And so often, right, even in our theology, I have to like pay attention to what the Holy Spirit is saying. And even when we look at Scripture, we have to pay attention, like, the Holy Spirit, what are you saying in the New Testament? And what are you saying all the way back in the book of Genesis? Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, right? This trinity shows up when it says, let God, let, let us create man in our image. See, we, we are created like him. He is, like, oftentimes I think of the Holy Spirit, or I think of God, I think of Jesus. I want to, like, think of hands and feet, Right? And, 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 right? and, and it's like we sit there and we, we try to understand this God that is beyond forever with our, human, with our humanness. But we talk about the Holy Spirit. He was there when God made this covenant with Abraham. The Holy Spirit was there when the people suffered and God rose up Moses to deliver the people in Egypt, right? The Holy Spirit has been there through it all. The, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, it's, it's like the second verse of the Bible. He shows up, it says he was there doing what? Hovering over the waters, right? It says this, the earth was out form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Right there, Genesis chapter 1, Verse 26, the Holy Spirit shows up. Verse 2, sorry, not verse 26. In fact, so many scriptures. Um, I put this, and I don't know if it ended up being in your phone, or I don't know if we even have a handout, but there are so many scriptures referencing the different names of the Holy Spirit. He's mentioned 96 times, right? The Spirit of the Lord is mentioned 28 times. The Spirit of God, 26 times. I, I threw this in your handout, and like you can just do what you want with it if you want to study it this week. But so often, um, we, 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 we make comments, and, and, and my theology is trying to like understand this God who is a finite, right? I love the Buzz Lightyear line, to infinity and beyond, but one thing Pastor Greg always taught me was that Infinity isn't even a thing for God because He's a finite. He's beyond any of it. And I sit there and I can't even wrap my mind around this amazing God. And when you look at all of these scriptures, it, look at this, it says the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of the, the fear of the Lord, the spirit of your Father, the spirit of glory, the spirit of grace, spirit of judgment, spirit of power, spirit of a sound mind, spirit of prophecy, Spirit of revelation, spirit of holiness, some amazing things. We see all through, how amazing is the Holy Spirit when we start breaking down who he is? We start looking at all of his attributes. He is amazing. Number four, and we're going to close with this. And, and I just wanted to kind of let us think about this for a minute as we leave today and maybe dwell on it over wherever your lunch plans are or your football brunch is today, whatever it might be. But here's what I want to leave us with, this idea. Number four, if Jesus totally depended on the Holy Spirit, then how much more do I need him in my life? Think about that for a minute, church. And that's what I want to close with today. If Jesus totally depended on the Holy Spirit, then how much more like, let's make it, not, I didn't want to say like, how much more do you and we, no, 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 how much more do I need him? 
If Jesus needed him and depended on him and operated with him always together, right? We see in the New Testament, Jesus always worked with the Holy Spirit. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, so he could even call the Holy Spirit his father as well, right? He was taught by the Holy Spirit. His power was given by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was empowered by the Holy Spirit. You know this in, 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 the, in the gospel, the book of John, I love the book of John, but it records the very first miracle of Jesus at the wedding feast, at the wedding party. And we all know the miracle that takes place. But here's what sometimes I think we forget, is Jesus only performed this miracle after chapter 1. Because you know what happens in, 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 in the previous chapter, I believe it's the chapter before, or the verses before, Jesus was empowered by the Holy Spirit when he was baptized in the Jordan River. So it's only after, right, this empowerment by the Holy Spirit, Jesus records this first miracle in Acts chapter 2. And like I said earlier, I think, and, and maybe I don't know if this is an 80s or a millennial, I'm kind of like on the cusp of whatever generation I'm a part of. I kind of like D-Generation X a little bit more than the millennial generation, but I think I fall into the millennial generation. But uh, I don't know if it's the 80s or 90s kid in me where I just grew up thinking and seeing so many different manifestations of the Holy Spirit that that's what I thought the relationship was to be all about. Right? I think it's so interesting to me because as people, we always want to replicate a concept that seems successful, don't we? Like we see something, I would hope, right? You see something that works and you're like, oh, I want to do that, right? And we do it with businesses, we do it with church growth, we do it, you, we, we, we do it all the time. We want to replicate a concept or a practice, yet we look at the life of Jesus operating totally uniquely with the Holy Spirit, and you know what's so crazy to me? <clears throat> Jesus didn't seem to have any consistent methods to his miracles, did he? Right? Like when you see Jesus operating with and the Holy Spirit working through him, empowering him, guiding him on the streets, who to do ministry, who to talk to, where to go, it's not a coincidence who he stumbled upon each day. Right? The Holy Spirit laid out his journey for him, right? Right? But it's so interesting to me, there is, it's like we get so stuck on the methods or the manifestations or the, the, the tongues, whatever it could be, when we talk about the Holy Spirit. But Jesus didn't seem to have consistent methods to his miracles. Some of the miracles, this would be a fun series to teach, wouldn't it? But sometimes Jesus would perform a miracle and he would just do what? He would speak to the storm. That's the, I would love that miracle all the time. Like, I just want to have that dad voice and just speak and it. I get what I want after I say what I want to have happen. Right? Disciples are thinking they're going to die on a boat. They wake him up. Hey, wake up. He's sleeping like a baby in the back seat of the, of, of the boat, whatever it is. He wakes up and he just tells the tor storm to knock it off. Right? Knock it off. We see the, the lady with the issue of blood that she makes her way through a crowd and it almost seems like she catch if, if you could do so, it seems as if she catches Jesus off guard because he asks the question, who touched me? I believe Jesus knew who, who touched him, but he wanted everybody else to know what's going on, right? But you see the woman with the issue of blood, she just touched his garment and she was healed. And the Bible says Jesus felt that, he felt power going from him, Right? We see these different methods. We see Jesus perform miracles where he just makes gross stuff in the mud and he decides to put it on someone's eyes. He spits in the mud and he decides to put it on their eyes and scales begin to fall off and the blind can see, right? We see Jesus put his fingers in somebody's ears, right? And so often it's like as a church, and I just remember growing up and kids would go to camp and they wouldn't receive the gift of tongues or sometimes i'll just say it like this sometimes to receive the gift of tongues we want to understand it and we want to we, we want it so bad and and we, we we teach our kids at camp that like kids would come home crying from camp because they didn't receive the gift of tongues does anybody remember the days like that i remember right i knew i had friends like that right they'd be like crying like something's wrong and sometimes it's just simply like you just got to open your mouth 
Sometimes we overthink it, right? We, and this isn't a message on tongues, but I remember like leaving camps and kids feeling like, man, what, what's wrong with me? That kid's speaking in tongues and I'm not. Whatever it is, and we would focus on this one particular gift, and yet we see that Jesus had many different methods of operating with the Holy Spirit. I love, I love the example from the soldier when he had, he, he had a servant who was sick. And you remember the centurion soldier? And Jesus says to him, I haven't seen faith like this. I haven't seen faith like this from my own people. Yet the foreigner, the conquering Roman soldier has more faith than the people who should have all the faith. And remember what he said to Jesus. His servant was sick and he says... I know who you are. I know how powerful you are. I just need you to give the command. Isn't that one of the coolest stories, coolest ways the Holy Spirit can move? He just says, I just need you to speak the word and he will be healed. And what happens? Jesus speaks and that servant from afar is healed. <clears throat> As we close today, Danette, would you come and play us out on the keys and get ready to pray together this morning as we get ready to dismiss somehow when we think of the Holy Spirit we talk about the gifts we talk about the manifestations we talk about um, even our Foursquare logo look at this is does anybody know what this is somebody said the Holy Spirit well is it the Holy Spirit or is it a dove to me, it looks like a dove, right? But sometimes we talk about the Holy Spirit and we, we reduce him to this peaceful, tweet, tweet, twitty bird dove, right? And I know if somebody was, I don't know who said it, so I'm not hammering, but right, it, it actually works out perfect, right? But often, don't we make references all the time? Like, does anybody here love sports and you see a track star and you could say, man, that girl runs like the wind, right? You could watch football today, last night, Deion Sanders' son playing football. I could say, that kid has an arm like a cannon. Does that mean his arm is a cannon? Right? Does that mean someone actually is wind when they're running? Right? No, the Bible says the Holy Spirit descending like a dove, giving this account in all four Gospels. It mentions the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. And so, yes, the Holy Spirit you know, in our four-square doctrine, it, it makes sense. But so often, it, it doesn't mean that he is a dove. We make these comments, right? Um, when I played baseball, people used to say, man, you run like you got a piano on your back. Does that mean I literally had a piano on my back? No, it was like figuratively, right? I remember I would run and people would say like, man, your face, your body, every inch of you is working so hard and you're just going nowhere, right? Just flopping around as I would run the bases, right? But the Holy Spirit, right? We, we make these, 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 like we talk. He's a person. He's deity. He is God. And he's been sent to be a lifelong partner, a lifelong leader, a lifelong companion. Jesus says so much. John chapter 14. A couple more scriptures. We need, I need to get going here. If you love me, obey my commands. Right? I would say it like this. All we need to get to heaven, we need to, we need to accept Jesus, accept what he did on the cross, and repent. But then I love what he says. Right? It's not a performance thing, but he says, but if you love me, you'll, now you'll obey. Obedience, right? Verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads in all truth. Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit is going to continue my work. He's going to do what I have been doing. He's going to be the exact work and the mission for us. He's the helper. He's the coach. He's here to direct us. He's here to correct us. He's here to counsel us. He's here to do life with us. The world cannot receive him, Scripture says, because it isn't looking for him and it doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives in you now and later he will be in you the bible says he's walking with us scripture here says he's lives with you and now and later will be in with will be goodness in you 
And why so often do we go through our day not mentioning him? He says he's with you. He's in you. The Bible says he's walking with us, and yet we go through our morning or our days without acknowledging the Holy Spirit. We even say things, and think about this, and I'm not like, I don't want to start this whole like theological debate from the stage, but, and I do it all the time. We say, ask Jesus into your heart. We, you know, even as kids, we teach kids, Jesus is in my heart. Well, technically, Jesus is in heaven. Technically, the Holy Spirit is in our heart, right? So often, like even our lingo, our language, and we neglect this greatest partner, the advocate, the counselor has been neglected. Think about what Jesus is saying to his disciples here. Our final verse, John chapter 15, and and man, there's a lot here. All right, how do we wrap this in in three minutes? You ready? I'm going to do it. John chapter 15, verse 5, but now I'm going away to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking me where I am going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. You grieve because I'm going away. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. And if I do go away, then I will send him to you. Think about what Jesus is saying here. Do we see this scripture here? Leave that up there. In fact, it's best for you that I leave you. Jesus was their leader. He was their everything. They had spent the last three years giving their time, their finances, their lives, time away from their families. They have seen miracles. They have seen every word he has said come to pass, every miracle he has performed. Jesus has been everything from uh, saying, hey, you're going to find a donkey in this location to feeding the 5,000, Jesus has done it all. They have seen it all. And yet what Jesus is saying here, we can't skip over verse seven because it's got to blow their minds. And I wouldn't want to hear this. He says, it's better for you, Peter, James, John, it's better that I'm leaving. No, 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 it's better that I don't stay here. And they've got to be thinking, you are joking. This is not how it's supposed to be, Jesus, right? And he says, it's better that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. And if I do go away, I will send him to you. Verse 8, and when he comes, here is what he will come to do. You ready for this? He will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. It goes on and on. But when we begin to realize Jesus was fully God yet fully man, yet his mission was different. His mission was what? Jesus knew that God sent him to die to give us access to the Father. That was his mission, right? But the Holy Spirit was sent to guide us, to counsel us, to protect us, to empower us, to convict us, to coach us. The Holy Spirit, he's just like Jesus, but he's not limited to one location. The Holy Spirit can carry on billions of conversations through prayer. He can work out billions of situations with billions of different people. He can teach like Jesus. He can amplify like Jesus. He can perform miracles like Jesus. He can do all of these things everywhere just like Jesus. And if we don't see why we don't need him in the church today, church, we, we, we desperately need more of the Holy Spirit. We need more conversations with him. We need him actively involved in our lives today. Somebody say amen. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and as we just begin this this short little series on the Holy Spirit, we thank you, God, for the, the spiritual hunger that we're seeing in the life of our church family. And pray, God, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. I pray that in weeks to come as we seek you, whether it's through our our different Bible studies, our different gatherings, our Sunday morning time, God, I pray that in the weeks to come as we seek you, as we get to know you, that we would be totally filled with your spirit, that we would know your presence, God, that we would be aware of your guidance, that we would be aware of your comfort, that we would experience your promptings in conversations, God, that we would experience your correction in conversations. God, when our speech is going outside the goalposts of good, good, positive speech, God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would help us and correct us. I pray that we would not go through life on on our own, 
on our own power and continue struggling, but God, we would know that the supernatural power and the presence of your Holy Spirit is available and in us and waiting. God, fill us, oh God, fill us with your Spirit so that we can live a life through your Holy Spirit, we can live a life glorifying you. We can live a life pointing people to you. In Jesus' holy name, can all God's people this morning say amen? Amen. amen. Well, God.